So I told you, last weekend I shared with you about the last week of Jesus' life on this earth, not after the ascension, after the resurrection, before the ascension, but before his resurrection. Uh, and we talked about Friday through the Thursday. And now we're gonna talk about Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And I told you that I would probably preach on the last day, but as I prayed, I couldn't just preach on Friday without talking about Saturday and Sunday as well, because Sunday turned out pretty well, you know? And uh, Resurrection Day. So we're gonna talk about Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but I need to remind you that a Jewish day begins when? Sundown. And the way they interpret that, uh, there's nothing in scripture that says this, but uh, at one point they decided we need to kind of have a precise time and so they, so they say when three stars appear. And the, the scripture they base it on is two or three witnesses. So that third star is the third witness that the day is, the evening has begun, and it goes back to Genesis 1, the evening and the morning, or the first day, the evening and the morning, or the second day, okay? So we're gonna talk about that, but these three days to me represent the death, the burial, and the resurrection, which are the three parts of the gospel, all right? So we'll talk about that. Just so you know the scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse three, Paul said, I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, and these are the three parts of what we call the gospel, because verse one of chapter 15 says, this is the gospel. And of course, the word gospel means good news. So here's the good news, that Christ died for our sins. That's good news, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Now we're gonna talk about also why the Bible doesn't just say that he died and rose again, but why being buried is important and why burial is important, all right? So number one, point number one is the first day. So we're gonna talk about that first day. Remember again, it started at sundown, so on Thursday night is when Friday began. And again, that's not that strange because our days begin at midnight. A new day begins at midnight, all right? So theirs began at sundown. So he ate the Passover meal with his disciples, and we find that what he told them, that he washed their feet before they ate the meal, and then we find that what he, the conversation, John 14, 15, 16, and some say in 17, prayed over, prayed over them, some say that was part of the prayer in the garden, okay? But then they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus has Peter, James, and John come a little closer with him, tells them to wait, and then goes a little farther to pray. And he does this three times, so he comes back, and he says to him one time, couldn't you stay awake just one hour? So we know at least one of the three he prayed for an hour. So we don't know if all three he did or not. The reason I'm telling you this is because we don't know the exact hour that he was arrested. We know the exact hour he was crucified, but not the exact hour he was arrested, but most believe it was 12 o'clock. I remember there used to be a teaching, the old King James said, could you not tarry for one hour? And there used to be a teaching about that, can you not tarry one hour? And it was talking about having a one hour quiet time. And you had a little notebook that went along with it, and you were to pray over all your friends and all your family, all of the elected officials, all the way down to the dog catcher. You know, you're supposed to pray over everything, everybody, every country, you know, everything. And I remember I went through the notebook and I thought, I've done it, I prayed for an hour, it had been seven minutes. <laughs> so I thought, you know, I really can't tarry for an hour for prayer, but I could probably tarry an hour for a shower. So if I could just go and relax for a little while. But the, the point is we don't know how long that he prayed. Sometime around midnight, could have been 10 or 11 p.m., probably around midnight, he's arrested and then at 9 a.m. he's crucified. So from around midnight to 8 or 8.30, this is what many people don't know, he went through six trials. Now if you wanna talk about a, a quick legal process, it was too quick. Six trials, three Jewish and three Romans, Roman trials. He was tried by Annas, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin, Annas and Caiaphas were high priests. Annas was Caiaphas's father-in-law. 
And then the Sanhedrin was a, a tribune, I mean, a, 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 a council would be the better way to say it, of 23 judges, kind of like a Supreme Court. And so smaller cases that were appealed, they were appealed to the Sanhedrin, to the council of 23 judges. So he's tried by Annas, Caiaphas, and then the Sanhedrin. Then somewhere around 6 a.m., about the time the sun came up, they went to Pilate. Pilate heard he was a Galilean, sent him to Herod. Herod then sends him back to Pilate. He's tried again by Pilate. By the way, the three, in the three Jewish trials, he's found guilty of blasphemy. And one of the reasons was because Caiaphas said to him, this I'm gonna use an old King James word here, he said, I adjure you, which means I command you, by the living God, tell us if you're the Messiah. Well, once he said that, then Jesus had to speak. And so when he commanded him by the living God, are you the Messiah, Jesus said, it is as you say. And that's when they said, we don't need to hear anymore. So in the three Jewish trials, he's found guilty. In the three Roman trials, he's found innocent. Pilate even makes a statement that's very famous to this day, I find no fault in him. And he made that statement twice, at the first and the third Roman trial, the two trials of Pilate, okay? So he is blindfolded, he is spat upon, they put a crown of thorns on his head. They put a purple robe on him. They hit him. They struck him with their fist and said, who hit you then? Because he was blindfolded. They plucked the beard from his face. He was beaten, we know for sure, by pilot soldiers and Herod soldiers and Jewish soldiers, but we don't know how many times by Jewish soldiers. So he's physically beaten at least three times. Please remember also now he's been up all night. So he has, he's had no rest, nothing to eat, nothing to drink. The reason I, I want you to understand that is because we're going to talk in detail about the scourging. Now, we're going to talk about the three days. I'm going to spend most of the time on Friday, though, because I want you to understand what physically Jesus went through for you and for me, all right? So we pick it up now at that third trial with Pilate. John 19, verse 1. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. I'm gonna go into great detail in a moment about what that meant because I really don't think anything we've ever seen or heard describes the truth of what happened when he was scourged. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe, and then they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands, and this again is a closed hand, what we would call a fist. Pilate then went out again again, so that's the second time he said this, and said to them, behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Now, according to, to my study, and I've, I've tried to study this for many, many years, and if you find differently, you can let me know, uh, Jesus is the only person in history that I found that was scourged and crucified because of how horrible scourging was. The Journal of the American Medical Association. So this is not a Christian publication. This is the magazine you see in doctor's offices that has the, just the initials at the top, J-A-M-A. -A, Journal of the American Medical Association. Some medical doctors, medical doctors, did an article, a study, a research using the New Testament as a historical document and other historical documents of the day and it's called The Physical Death of Jesus. It's on the physical, physical death of Jesus. What happened to him physically, all right? So, when I, so I'm gonna show you some, some sketches from that report. Let me warn you, they're graphic because what happened to him was horrific. So they are very graphic, but this is not from a preacher. This is from the Journal of the American Medical Association on the physical death. Of Jesus. So here's the first graphic that I want to show you. This is the graphic from, again, the Journal of the American Medical Association on the scourging of Jesus. And I want to read you what a Greek scholar named Rick Renner, he wrote the, some of the, the, there's a series of books called Sparkling Gems. He is a Greek scholar. He's probably the foremost Greek scholar in the world today. 
He's a strong believer in, in Jesus, uh, and he's also a Greek historian. I want to read you what he wrote, and I'm going to leave the picture on the side screens so you can understand what actually happened, all right? This is what Rick Renner wrote on the word scourged. The word scourge was one of the most horrific words used in the ancient world. When the decision was made to scourge an individual, the victim was first stripped of his entire, was first stripped so his entire flesh would be open and uncovered. Then the victim's hands were tied over his head to a scourging post and his wrists were securely shackled in the metal rings to re restrain his body from movement. When in this locked position, the victim could not wiggle or move at all to avoid or dodge any of the lashes. Romans were professionals at scourging. They took special delight in the fact that they were the best at punishing a victim with this brutal act. Once the victim was harnessed to the post, the Roman soldier began to put him through unimaginable torture. One writer of the day, this is a historian of the day, notes the mere anticipation of the first blow, and he's talking about a scourging that he saw, caused the victim's body to grow rigid, the muscles to knot in his stomach, the color to drain from his cheeks, and his lips to draw tightly against his teeth as he waited for the first sadistic blow that would begin tearing open his body. The scourge itself consisted of a short wooden handle with several 18 to 24 inch straps of leather. The ends of these pieces of leather were equipped with sharp, rugged pieces of metal, wire, glass, and jagged fragments of bone. This was considered to be one of the most feared and deadly weapons of the Roman world. It was so horrific that the mere threat of scourging could calm an entire crowd or bend the will of the strongest rebel. Most often, two soldiers would carry out the punishment simultaneously, lashing the victim from both sides. Every time the torturer struck the victim, the straps of leather attached to the wooden handle would cause multiple lashes as the pieces of metal, glass, wire, and bone sank into his flesh and then raked across the victim's body. Then the soldier would jerk back the scourge, pulling hard in order to tear whole pieces of human flesh from the body. The victim's back, legs, stomach, upper chest, and face would soon be disfigured by the slashing blows of the whip. Historical records of the day describe one victim's back as being so mutilated after a Roman scourging that his spine was actually exposed. Another recorded how the bowels of a victim spilled out through the open wounds created by the whip. If the scourging wasn't stopped, the slicing of the whip would eventually flay, uh, flay the victim's flesh completely off of his body. With so many blood vessels sliced open by the wit, the victim would begin to experience profuse loss of blood and bodily fluids. Because of the massive loss of bodily fluids, he would experience excruciating thirst, often fainting from the pain and eventually going into shock. Frequently, the victim's heartbeat would become so irregular that he would go into cardiac arrest. This was not a Jewish scourging. This was a Roman scourging. According to Jewish law, the Jews were permitted to give 40 lashes to a victim. Many people have said this many, many times, that Jesus received 39 lashes. This, it's not true, though. But because, and this is the reason, the Jews were permitted, this is in Scripture, in the, in the law, to give 40 lashes to a victim. But because the 40th lash usually proved fatal, the number of lashes given was reduced to 39, as Paul noted in 2 Corinthians. That, again, is a Jewish scourging. This was not a Jewish scourging. But the Romans had no limit to the number of lashes that they could give a victim. And the scourging Jesus experienced was at the hands of the Romans. Therefore, it is entirely possible that when the soldier pulled out his scourge to beat Jesus, he may have laid more than 40 lashes across his body. 
The New Testament does not tell us what Jesus looked like after he was scourged, but Isaiah does. Isaiah 52 verse 14 says, but many were amazed. This word amazed is normally translated appalled or shocked. Many were appalled when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know that he was a man. That's the scourging that Jesus endured for us. They took him then from the scourging, which again, he's the only person I know of that I've found that was scourged and crucified. They took him from the scourging and they crucified him. John 19 verse 31 says, therefore because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then this, I'll explain in a minute about the breaking of legs. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, that would be the, one of the thieves, and of the other, that's the other thief, who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. Now this report, the Journal of the American Medical Association explains, it's worth reading, you can find it on the internet. It's worth reading because it explains why the person, uh, why blood and water actually came out. Now look at John 19 verse 36. For these things were done that scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierce. Two messianic prophecies fulfilled that day. There are 53 messianic prophecies. I couldn't, I couldn't find exactly, I just didn't have time. I didn't think about it until we were coming right up to this weekend. But what I realized was about a third of the 53 messianic prophecies were fulfilled on that Friday, on the very first day, all right? So let me just show you just a few more. Psalm 22, one, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus said that on the cross. Psalm 22, 16, they pierce my hands and my feet. Psalm 22, 18, they divide my garments among them and for my clothing, they cast lots. This next verse has three messianic prophecies in one verse fulfilled on the same day, on the day Jesus was crucified. Isaiah 50, verse six, I gave my back to those who struck me, we just saw the picture of it, and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard, I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. And if you read the crucifixion in the Gospels, you'll see that they spat on him as well. The word excruciating, you've probably heard this word before, I, I, you know, it's, I'm in excruciating pain but what you may not know is where the word came from. The, let me show you the word excruciating. Uh, this is the word excruciating, and then notice the word crucify. Many of our words come from the Latin, which come from the Greek. Now, if you see excruciating and then the word crucify, I want you to notice the C-R-U-C-I in excruciating and the C-R-U-C-I in crucify. Excruciating comes from the word crucify. That's the root of it. Crucify, by the way, comes from the word cruci, which is the Latin word for cross. When you add the F-Y on the end, it means to fasten. So crucify means to fasten someone to a cross. Excruciating means the type of pain that someone in, in, would endure who is fastened to a cross. That's what it means. That's where it come from, comes from. So they drove nails in his wrists and in his feet. You need to know they, they used to put him in the palm of the hand until about 30 years BC before Christ. But they found out that they could get free because the cartilages in the back of your hand are not as strong. So they put him between the two bones in the wrist and the medic, again, the Journal of the American Medical Association shows a picture of this. So this is the picture of where they believe that the spikes went through the wrist of Jesus. This way, it would not sever any artery because they didn't want the person to bleed to death. They have records of people who actually hung on the cross that didn't die until the fourth day. This is one of the reasons they break their legs and I'll go into that in further detail in just a moment. So they put the two spikes in the wrist 
If you actually, on the back of your hand, between those two bones, there's a little soft spot, you'd know exactly where that spike would have gone so that that's, there was no way then they could ever get free from that. Also, all of their weight rested on that and then on one other spike between the feet. Here again is from the Journal of the American Medical Association. This is where they believe the spike went through the feet because it could enter here and it would, be held, it would hold the weight of the body because of the bones, but it wouldn't break a bone. So there was no seat for Jesus to sit on. You may have seen that in some movie where the person crucified is sitting on a seat. There was also no platform for his feet. His feet were driven directly into the wooden beam. So his entire weight rested on the three spikes, two in his wrist and one in his feet. The, the, this is from the Journal of the American Medical Association. When a person is hanging like this, and this is a graphic that they showed in this report, when a person is hanging in this position, the person can inhale, but he cannot exhale because his diaphragm would not be able to release to be able to exhale. So in order to, to exhale, you can see from this, di this diagram, he would have to pull on the two wrists in his, two spikes in his wrist, not his hands, not his palms, his wrist, and he'd have to push on the spike, and again, you can see the spike goes directly into the beam. He'd have to push himself up. This is why they would break their legs, because the person could continue to release his diaphragm by pushing with his legs. His legs would have enough strength, but if they broke the legs, they would die within a few minutes because they wouldn't have enough strength to be able to pull their weight up with their arms extended. It's one thing to do a pull up or chin up like this. It's another thing to do one when it's extended like this. The other thing you need to know is that every time he breathed, every time he took a breath for six hours, he was crucified at nine, he died at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Every time he took a breath, he would have to raise his body up Remember, his back had just been scourged. So his back would have been going up and down for six hours on that wooden cross. And when they came to him to break the legs, they said he's already dead, but a soldier took a spear and pierced his side, and because blood and water came out, according to the Journal of the American Medical Association, they believed that the spear entered from the right side and went through the lung into the heart. And because blood <clears throat> and water came out, now this is again, is what medical doctors said. The cause of the death, the physical death of Jesus, this is what the report says. Jesus died of cardiac rupture. Cardiac rupture. In other words, his heart would have burst. Cardiac, cardi, come from the Greek cardi, which means heart like a cardiac arrest or something, cardiac, cardiac rupture. I was sharing that with one of the medical doctors in our church who had read this report as well, who said, I, this is a very accurate medical report. But he said, but when you say cardiac rupture, Robert, let me give that to you in layman's terms. Jesus died of a broken heart. That's why he died. His heart broke because blood and water came out. So we're now coming to the end of the first day but I want to talk about the second day, which talks about burial. But you got to know that he was buried on the first day. That's how we get the three days. So he's buried on Friday before the sun goes down. That's why they wanted the legs broken so they could get him in the tomb because it would have been work to move his body into the tomb. And once it was dark, once the second day started, they wouldn't be able to. So he's buried on the first day. Then they asked for guards to be posted. Then they asked for the stone to be sealed. So I want you to think about this. It took many, many men to move that. If you've ever seen a boulder that large, it would take many, many men to move that boulder. But then they sealed it. Well, the only way you would seal a stone would be by mortar. So it's sealed, and they had mortar back then. So they seal this stone with mortar all the way around it. They seal it. The stone, you just, just read it in the New Testament. I didn't have time to go through all the scripture. The stone is set and sealed and that, now this is what that represents burial. This is why it's so important is because it represents finality. 
This, in the, according to scripture, burial represents baptism. Now, I have a real burden for men to make public professions of their faith today in Jesus because there are a lot of men who try to make private professions of their faith. And you need to make a public profession of your faith. You may have been baptized as a child or you may have been sprinkled, but the word baptizo means to dip. It's not to sprinkle, it's to dip, to go in the water. The reason is when you're, when you're buried in the water, there's, if he doesn't bring you up and you can't get up, you're gonna die. So it's not sprinkling a few drops on you, it's you're buried, it's representing you're buried with Christ. Colossians chapter two, verse 11 says, when you came to Christ, you were circumcised not by a physical procedure, Christ performed a spiritual circumcision. So a, a cutting away of the flesh, but the flesh here is referred to as the sinful nature. So watch, the cutting away of your sinful nature. Watch, for you were buried with Christ, and this is what a lot of people miss, when you were baptized. You were buried with Christ when you were baptized. If you were baptized as an infant, or if you were even baptized as a child, but you had not truly given your life to Jesus, you need to be water baptized. Um, I can't talk about water baptism, though, without telling you one humorous story. I know this is a very heavy message because it's a heavy subject of what happened with Jesus when he died for our sins. But, I, so I thought, let me, I'm just gonna tell you a, a, a humorous story to just lighten the mood for a moment. Uh, I, I used to, this, uh, you, when I grew up, I grew up in a church that had a baptistry behind the pulpit, behind the choir loft. Does anyone remember that? And it, it, you had curtains, and then you'd open the curtains, and there was always a, a painting of a river there, very beautiful, painted by one of the ladies in the church. <laughs> You're hearing some of my personal feelings there. I think you could have spent a little bit of the budget on someone that actually took art lessons. But anyway, <laughs> so, and then there, there would be a tank, but on the front of it would be a sheetrock wall up to so high, and then about 18 to 24 inches of glass, maybe plexiglass, right? Everyone remember this? Okay. So I have a friend of mine who pastored a church <laughs> that when he got there, they had decided to make the entire front plexiglass. Let me say that again. <laughs> the whole front was plexiglass. Yeah, they realized their mistake after the first baptism. But <laughs> during that first baptism, he was baptizing. And the men would come down from his left, come down this way, and go right back up because that was the men's baptismal changing room. The women would come down from his right, or your left as you're looking at me, from this way, and then they'd go straight back up because that was the women's baptismal changing room, you understand? So this pastor friend of mine baptized a man, and without thinking, the man, because he came in this way, and he knows another man's gonna follow him, he just started going up those stairs. Well, there were women standing at the top waiting to baptize. They said, no, you can't come. This is a, there's a changing room here for ladies are changing. You can't come this way. So he realized his mistake, he turned around, but the pastor was already saying, according to your public profession of faith, you know. So he decided to just swim across. <laughs> but he forgot about the plexiglass front. So this pastor is, according to your public profession of faith, So that's the second day. Here's the third day, which is resurrection. An angel shows up right at daylight. An angel shows up, I just want you to think about this, and rolls away the sealed stone. One angel, one angel. You realize when, when Satan gets thrown in the bottomless pit, it's only one angel that does it. Do you know that? 
We don't, we don't, I don't think we realize how powerful these angels are. I mean, it's kind of like Jesus is, uh, is like, you know what? I'm tired of it. I'm going back. It's the second coming. I'm going to go and go get Satan and throw him in the bottomless pit. And Gabriel says, well, who should we send? I don't know. Just send the new guy. Just, you know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I just, there just needs to be one. That's, that's it. Just, you know, okay. So one angel shows up. Many people believe that the descriptions of angels and the, as the giants that were the that bread and the giants came, that angels are around 20 feet tall, twice the size of a basketball goal. So one angel shows up, moves the seal stone that many, many guards put in place. But here's what's cool. Read this. This, this is, I can't remember which gospel it's in right now. I think Matthew. But it says, he rolled away the stone and then he sat on top of it. I think this is one of the angels that has been, uh, that guards Texas, personally. <laughs> he had a little Texan in him. I think he sat on top of that stone and went like this to the guards. Any of you? You, you want some? <laughs> Any of you have a problem? You want to say something to me? <laughs> and people say they fell like dead men. That's not exactly what it says. It says, before that, it says they shook. So they saw it. It also says they went back into the city and reported what had happened. So they didn't just pass out or faint. They, here, it says they shook, and then it says, and fell like dead men. I think, if you want to go back to Texan, they played possum. <laughs> I think they were like this. And Jesus comes out, he appears, he appears to Mary, talks to Mary in the garden, then he appears to some other women that were coming to prepare his body for burial. Then he says, go tell my disciples, I'm coming to meet with them. So that's where he picked it up, John 20, verse 19. On the evening of that day, now this is the third day that we're talking about, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, but it's the first day of the week, you'll see, Sunday. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, this is what we're celebrating this weekend, Resurrection Day. The doors being locked. I just want you to notice, locked. Locked. Let me, just, let me just clarify. The women were going to the tomb, taking care of what needed. The women were working. The men were hiding behind locked doors. That's a whole different sermon. We'll save that for the XO conference, all right? But... The doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. But do you see, does everyone see the word locked? Does everyone see that? Every campus, everyone see the word locked? Okay, watch this. Jesus came and stood among them, but the doors were locked, and said to them, peace be to you. Now, we don't say peace a lot. We did in the 70s when I was in peace, you know, we did back then. <laughs> but we were also very high back then, but... <laughs> So now we might say, chill out, relax, okay. It's normal to say something like that after you've walked through a wall. That's just normal. <laughs> this is what this tells me though. Jesus did not have a resuscitated body. Jesus had a resurrected body. A brand new heavenly body. And this is why burial is so important. What happened to me last year, in essence, was I was resuscitated. I have a resuscitated body. One day, though, I'm going to have a resurrected body. And I'm, when you see me in heaven, I'm going to look good. Because <laughs> I'm going to have a resurrected body. And by the way, Jesus could walk through walls. I just want you to know, if I run out of Bluebell, I'm coming through your wall. <laughs> just lock the doors all you want. I'll be the one rummaging through your freezer. Hmm. Now, I told you my concern this, this Easter is for grown men to make public professions of faith. Friday and Saturday, we've had hundreds, hundreds of grown men. Grown men need to stop hiding behind locked doors. 
They need to make public professions of faith in Jesus Christ. And they need to be water baptized. They, they, many of them have a lot of problems with the flesh because they've never been buried with him in baptism and had the flesh cut away. When the Israelites went through the Red Sea, the enemy was left in the sea. I'm telling you, you're fighting some battles that if you just swallow your pride and profess Christ publicly, you wouldn't have to fight as many battles as you're fighting. I have, when I got saved, I came out of drugs, most of you know. So nearly all of my friends did drugs. I went back and tried to witness to every one of them. I remember one of them saying to me, I can believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I really do believe that. I just don't believe that story that he died and was raised from the grave. I just can't believe that. I knew enough scripture, I'd only been saved a few months, but I knew enough scripture that I said to him, then you can't be saved. But this is scripture. And it's a scripture you know. But let's take it for what it says. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, and God's the only one that knows what you believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You must believe in the resurrection to be saved. Uh, James Robinson is one of our apostolic elders. He used to preach these great big, great big, he used to break records in stadiums and coliseums, these citywide crusades like you Billy Graham did. And one night he was in a stadium, and this is back before AstroTurf and things like that, and it had rained the night before, so you could kind of see footprints, you know, in the football field as people were coming to Christ. He was inviting people to come to Christ, and he could see this huge, huge man, great big man, just sobbing, coming to Christ. But he kept seeing something beside this, behind this man. Now, this man was very, very tall and very large, and a very strong man, you could tell. But he kept seeing something, and James said, I moved to the side of the platform to see what was behind this man, what I kept looking at. And behind the man was a little boy that was walking like this. He was walking in his father's footsteps. Men, it's important that you profess Christ publicly because somebody's watching you. Someone's following in your footsteps.